Nothing in life is perfect, and if it is, it's likely gonna soon be logged. I love this sport and have lived and breathed bikes for well over 25 years now. With any enduring relationship, there are always some well-positioned complaints just underneath the hood. Modern day mountain bikes are better than fresh toast, with crank spindles not snapping, most shocks lasting more than a week, and we're almost to the point of reliable drop receipt posts. But outside of all that perfection, there are still some things that really burnt my tires. I'm willing to name some names here, but I'll also mention Ew. who's doing things well and spread some positive love. This video is definitely not all complaining. Let's work our way from the least annoying to the most egregiously offensive and start with lucky number seven. Seven. I love pedals, I turn them daily, and I love bottom brackets. And you know what? I haven't had a pedal unthread from a crank arm in years. It's about as common as the Sierra Club supporting new mountain bike trails that I have any issue at all with a bottom bracket, which is to say, nearly never. But if you check the literature, pedals and bottom brackets both have absolutely insane torque specs. This is somewhat of a niche complaint here, but no torque spec and trusting the mechanic's common sense is honestly a better solution. I mean, steel pedal threads at 50 Newton meters into an aluminum crank arm is insane. That's like having an outreach program placing violent prison inmates as preschool teachers. On the flip side, there are engineering optimists who designate specs that are too loose. Last week, I had a stem slipping despite using an actual torque wrench. I'm turning over a new leaf for 2023 here, getting a little bit better at all the things. Park Tool sent some torque wrenches, so thanks to Park Tool. And I'm gonna try using these, six Newton meter, get this as tight as it should be, and no tighter. Hell yeah! I once had a bike where the entire swing arm was held on with aluminum bolts that could only handle a hand-tight five oh, yeah. Newton meter spec. If you're trusting your own life to something, it's a self-preservation instinct to want it more than just hand tight. Perhaps at least elbow, if not ass tight. It's worth asking, how many of you actually own and use a torque wrench? Or do you do what I've done for many years? Look at a torque spec and assess, do I need to really lean on this? Six. We all love learning about the latest tech, and that's a big part of what keeps this YouTube channel going. But we all get so sad learning that some of these mythical new products are still at least six months away from delivery. Typically, a bike brand will hear about a competitor coming out with a similar product and decide they need to hurry up and announce their own product, becoming the first to market, even if it'll be months, if not almost a year, with no delivery. Sure, while it's fun to get your name out there, it's 2023. Social media is everything. If the product isn't a physical reality, your brand kind of just ends up like just wearing monster shoes and a red nose. If you can't search a hashtag related to a product and see it in your neighbor's garage, you understand pretty quickly that said product doesn't exist. Has this ever happened to you? It's happening to me right now, as I try to get a new electric pit bike to add to my Minimoto fleet. But I will say that some brands, like Yeti and Pivot, do a great job of not just waiting patiently, but even having product readily available when they release it. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we're getting into summertime. Temperatures are going up and humidity levels are also rising. It turns into a sweat fest out on the trails. And I found that if I'm riding more than an hour or two, I can get a little bit woozy and lightheaded. And oftentimes I think I just need to drink more water. Well, if you want a water bottle to be more effective, there's one really cool trick you can do, and that's to add an electrolyte supplement to your water bottle. And that'll stretch it out quite a bit further. And I found it makes it much more effective in rehydrating you on the trail. I've been lucky enough to partner with the folk over at Element who make a really simple electrolyte mix. It's just sodium, potassium, magnesium, tiny bit of stevia, very simple, straightforward mix. And I just add one of these to my water bottle and that supplements a full hydration pack. And I found I'm good for a full four to five hours on the trail with just that setup alone. For a limited time, Element's offering a free sample pack with any purchase from the link I've got in the description down below. That URL is drinkelementlmnt dot com slash jeff j-e-f-f -F. this is the raspberry salt flavor i'm quite enjoying it a lot of you guys have tried this stuff out and i've got your feedback in the comments that you quite enjoy it give it a try i think you'll like it big thanks to element and don't forget peace wheelies but most importantly stay salty as they say have a great ride everyone five bloody shins or bloody knuckles take your pick while it's fun to modify your bike i'd say it's even more fun to be out in the trees riding said bike According to the Center for Disease Control, the average American man weighs 200 pounds. At 170 pounds, I'm over 15% lighter than the average, and while sure, I like a poppy bike, I still end up needing to stuff so many shocks full of spacers. What will an aggressive 220-pound rider end up needing? The answer for many is, unfortunately, a very different bike. I get it, build the stock bike to work for a lower level rider, but please, for the love of all that is mechanical, do not set up that stock suspension so that even a newer rider already needs a big old 0.5 volume reducer. 
Instead, have the stock setting like small, 0.2 or no reducer. That way the experts can then go up as they need to, but they're not already stuck with a large spacer in there from the get-go. Somehow it's rare that I can unbox a new bike and learn I don't have to futz around with unthreading the stock air can and sourcing spacers. This brings up a bigger question. Does a brand design a bike for the average buyer or for the pros? Huge props to Rocky Mountain here, as the Ride 9 adjustability allows for a physical frame adjustment that makes a noticeable difference to the progression. Also props to Yeti, as the SB130 and SB140 have great progression and don't need really any extra volume reduction. Four. Carbon fiber should be the main blame here, but sadly, this has been going on for as long as I've been around the bike industry. When it's time to design a new bike, most brands just make an educated guess with their new geometry, get molds cut, and proceed to claim it to be the best. Sure, they will play around different shocks and angle sets and wheels and have some sort of an idea of what works, it's an educated guess. But very few brands actually A-B test new geometry. I have a few theories about geometry, but not until I partner up with a brand that actually has an in-house frame builder will I ever get to try them out. Big props to Transition Bikes, Santa Cruz Bikes, Rocky Mountain, and Pivot, as all these brands do build aluminum test mules to try out various new ideas. I think Transition has been the most innovative here, as back in 2017, they launched bikes that are still relevant, geometry-wise, this very day. E-bikes in particular still have massive room for innovation, but there is so much pressure to make everything out of carbon that it appears career suicide to try something far off what's currently accepted. Examples of this include bottom bracket heights, seat tube angles, and stack heights. The Niner WFO rode amazing, but the bottom bracket was simply too low. The Ibis Ritmo is one of my favorite bikes of all time, but I also feel it's a touch lower than necessary. The Pivot Firebird is about 10 millimeters taller than the Ritmo, but still handles great. Catching pedals is the terrible way to go, and experimenting with a touch more height in the bottom bracket zone would be well served. But alas, just like fabricating a virus, that's an expensive experiment. Three. Competition between brands has spurred some awesome innovation, which has made today's bikes better than ever. Unfortunately, sometimes those in the trenches and product management can get hyper fixated on what the competition is doing, leading to trends. Spec trends like the X2 rear shock on mid-travel bikes, headset cable routing, or flimsy tires. This is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy where once a bunch of brands support a bad spec, the spec becomes more common and even demanded by consumers. Even worse, these products become more widely available and cheaper and more brands kind of get stuck using that stuff. Other things like geometry trends, assuming we need vertical seat tubes on all e-bikes or all geometry numbers need to be similar, keep us from actually making forward progress. It's scary for a brand to do something different and buck a trend, but we've seen plenty of brands still have success by staying quite true to themselves. Buying trends are even worse, as when a consumer looks at spec A in a spreadsheet and compares to spec B, they often lose the forest for the trees and get prone to buying a bike because of some sort of minute detail that doesn't really provide a real benefit. Think of the Tommy Boy brake pad accident skit. You'd rather just have a good product than a guaranteed product. Couple extra pennies. Told you it was a guaranteed piece of Two. How nice is it to set out on a warm, green spring day for a mellow little pedal? No need for a jacket. The ride is so short, you don't need a sandwich. So hey, no backpack, mom. But not on these bikes. What do you think I am, a camel? I ride with a pack a lot. I take it off when we're filming with a big camera, but it's there. In addition, I'll run an element-equipped water bottle on the bike. Now, when I can't run a full-size bottle, ah, oh, that's such a disappointment. The Kona process bikes are awesome, but come on, minimal bottle clearance, ugh. I'm thankful that the Ritmo, the SB160, the Orbea Rayon, and more do have full-size bottle clearance. If I'm buying a bike, you can sure bet that full-size bottle compatibility is going to be a key deciding factor. What have you been waiting for? Number one. My favorite parts of mountain biking are when I'm standing up and playing around with the bike. Body English is essential to get the bike to do what you want it to, and for that, you've got to get into all sorts of positions on the bike. More than anything, it requires getting low on the bike. My number one pet peeve is bikes that can't fit a long dropper seat post. This Mondraker rode awesome, but it came with a 125mm post and had little space for any more. We've gone backwards here. My 2018 Ibis Ritmo could fit a 200mm dropper, as could my 2020 Rocky Altitude, 2020 SB130, and Orbea Aachen, all good. Then the Transition Spire could barely fit 185. The SB140 had less insertion than the SB130. The electrified version of the Occam, the famous for Bay Arise, has a charge port on the seat tube and can barely fit a 150 dropper. With steep seat angles, we need all that extra drop more than ever. I really don't like anything with less than 170 millimeters of drop and still prefer 200 over 170. At least I'm stoked that my Ritmos, Processes, Occam, and SB160 can all fit decently long seat posts. 
I know this is a lot of complaining, but if anyone who works at a bike brand gets inspired by this video, I think it'll only help improve all of our mountain biking experiences. Coming from a childhood of threaded one inch headsets, square taper bottom brackets, rims made of cheese and quick release axles, today's bikes are absolutely incredible. This is too much fun. But as exciting as this progress has been, I'm even more excited for the next generation of bikes. Let me know in the comments what I missed. If you haven't yet, try Element. I really like that stuff quite a lot. And finally, thank you so much for subscribing. Peace and wheelies, everyone.